Hey, it's Kevin DeWitt here. Welcome to the Bare Essentials for a Home Music Studio course. This is a short course, cut down version of my full setting up a home stu music studio course. And I thank you for checking this one out. And hopefully by the end of this, you will have enough information to set up a small home music studio, just with the bare essentials, just enough to get you started and get you recording in your home and starting to get your songs out to the world. Okay, if you're new to my site and you're new to my content, let me introduce myself. As I said, my name's Kevin DeWitt and I'm the owner and operator of KDW Mixing and Mastering. My business is basically me and I provide mixing and mastering services to people all over the world. So I've been mixing and mastering for a long time. I've been recording my own material and I wanted to get into the point where I started helping other people to create their own. Instead of me just mixing and mastering for you, I wanted to teach people how to do it. So one of the problems with teaching mixing and mastering is most people want to start off obviously at the start with the home studio and the recording side. So hence the reason for this course. So the purpose of this course is to set up, as I said, a small home music studio, just the bare essentials, the first part of any home music studio. Obviously a home music studio can go from a tiny little bit to a massive amount, but you wanna start uh, with a small amount. So if you're brand new to recording and you play an instrument or sing or produce, whatever you do, and you're looking to start a home music studio, then obviously this is where you want to start. This is the bare basics. This is going to give you just exactly what you need to get started without spending massive amounts of money, without you know building fancy studios or anything like that. It's just to get you off the ground using facilities in your own house with some minimal amount of equipment to get going. So the reason we start off with the bare essentials is because you, if you, you could be a rich person that has lots and lots of money and you go out and you buy a fancy design music studio with fully kitted out with all the fancy gear, big mixing desks and everything else and you go and sit down to record your music and you just sit there and have no idea how to operate any equipment. Starting off with the bare basics, what, what you know, a lot of people that have been doing it for years may think that it's a waste of time or anything else, but to me it's not. You've got to start at the basics, you've got to start at the bare bones. It's the only way to learn and it's the only way to grow. You can create great music with this bare essentials, so don't get me wrong, this is not a joke of uh, a setup. This is what you need to create some really fantastic music and get great results. So don't write it off just because it is the bare essentials. It's the best place to start best place to learn and you are going to grow from this and move forward. Now obviously not everybody has a lot of money, not everybody is rich. So how do you do this without spending tons of money but still getting great results? And that is exactly the point of this course is to get you those results. Now obviously I'm going to run through what I think are the bare essentials, but everybody's setup is slightly different, all right? Because everybody does different things. You know, you may be a guitar player, you may be a drummer, you may be a vocalist, you may be a keyboard player. You may not even play an instrument at all, but you're a producer and you like to sit there working on beats and samples and all things like that that are still creating music, but they're done in a way that you don't actually play an instrument as such. And because of that, everybody's setup is going to be slightly different. So you need to allow for that and you need to take what I'm teaching you and adapt it to your exact situation. And again, everybody's got different amount of money. So what I'm considering to be a bare essentials, you may need to buy cheaper or you may decide to spend more to, to get yourself ahead of the game going forward. And again, that is entirely your choice. The main thing to take out of this and the main thing I want you to focus on no matter where you are or what you're doing in this course is that you to have fun, okay? There's no point doing this if you are not having fun, right? We, we're here to create music. You wanna create music, it's an art, okay? It's not a science. You don't have to have everything exact. You don't have to have everything perfectly laid out and everything else. But what you wanna do is to make sure you're having fun 
through the whole process and that includes setting up this home studio. Right, so it's not to be a stressful situation. I don't want you panicking about money or getting everything right or not doing everything exactly as I'm saying it or anything like that. Have fun and make sure that at the end of the day, the point of it is to be able to allow you to create music and enjoy it. So selecting your room may seem like a very obvious thing to do, quite trivial, and to be honest with you, it sort of is, but it's obviously an essential part. And there is some factors that need to be considered when you're looking at where to place your home music studio in your house. Now, some obvious factors that come into play here is what are you going to use the room for? So you need to keep that in mind. Are you going to be just recording in there? Are you going to be recording, mixing and mastering? How far are you going to take this setup? So one of the other big factors in choosing your room is what are you actually going to be recording in there? So I'm assuming that you're going to be recording at a minimum level. Whether that's recording just yourself or recording other artists, what size room are you going to need? So think about the instrumentation you're going to be recording. So the other thing to think about with your selection of a room is do you need to consider other people in the house? You know, do you have a newborn baby? And if you do, do you really want to have your music studio in the room right next to theirs? Are you going to be waking them up by playing loud instrumentation in the middle of the night or whenever you get the opportunity? Now, on the flip side, you also don't want noise from a baby crying or that going into your recordings if you can avoid it. Now, you may not even have a choice of what room you can use, right? You may be stuck with whatever you've got. You may just be with a desk in your bedroom. That's fine, okay? This is not about setting limitations. This is not about being disappointed and going, oh, well, I can't do it because I can't get a room. You're going to use what you have available to you. And there are gonna be some limitations with using a small part of a bedroom, but you just need to understand those limitations and work around them. It's not going to stop you from building a home music studio, and I don't want it to. Look around your house, and make a decision about what room you think is most suitable for what you want to do. Hopefully in the previous step, you've gone and picked your room or at least narrowed it down to a couple of options uh, if you aren't already locked into a specific spot or room. And now we're gonna talk about how we're gonna actually lay it out. So the desk location, this is obviously one of the most critical things and it's not so critical for the bare essential side of things because with the bare essentials we're talking mainly about going to be using headphones and not so much putting root treatment or studio monitors or anything like that. So it's not essential but because I always like to do this thinking for the future. So keeping in mind the future factor of having studio monitors and things like that, what we want to do is if we have a choice of where we put our desk in our room, we want to put it on the smaller side of the room. So if we've got a room that's rectangular, which is an ideal situation if we can, we want to put it along the small side. So we're going to be shooting our music down the length of the room, so the long way. Now, the other thing you want to do is put the desk central between the walls, okay? Because when we're working in mixing, especially, we've got, you know, we're trying to get our sound really good, okay? And stereo image is one of those vital things. Now, another key point is that uh, if you can get the desk away from the walls, especially corners, if you can avoid putting your desk in corners, that's a whole heap better. Because again, when we get to studio monitors, bass frequencies like to build up in corners. So if you put your desk in the corners, you're going to get a big build up of bass. Now, as I stated, a lot of these things that I'm talking about with room location is based on the future. Now, if you know for a fact that you are never going to go to studio monitors, you are never going to go to that next level and you are only ever going to use headphones, then where you place your desk is totally irrelevant. It is basically what is comfortable for you, what looks good in your room, in your house, what do you like, where have you got, and are you comfortable? That's really it. Mm -hmm. 
this video here, we're talking about furniture requirements and it sort of goes part in part with the previous two, okay? Because I've talked about you filling out worksheets of how you want things laid out, what room to pick and the design of your actual room. Now, knowing what furniture you're gonna put into it may be a critical part of the previous step. So if you were struggling a little bit with the previous step, hopefully this one will give you some further ideas on that if you haven't already worked these parts out. The first critical decision that I stated in the previous topic of your room layout and design was the desk location. So obviously in this part, when we're talking about furniture requirements, the first item I'm gonna talk about is the desk. So you need to think about what sort of desk you wanna get. Now, again, you may already have a desk, you may be locked into that desk, you may not be changing that desk. And if that's the case, that's fine. You have nothing to really think about with this desk. You've already got it, you're gonna utilize it. But if you haven't got a desk, or you are looking to possibly think about getting a new desk, then you need to consider a few things about that desk. So a couple of key factors for your desk are going to be what size desk you need for the stuff you're gonna put on it, and what size desk is gonna fit in the room that you've picked. It's no point buying a custom built, massive mixing recording desk if it's not gonna fit in your room. So obviously you need to factor that in first, all right? And that's part of your layout and design. Hopefully, if you went through your layout, your design, and you hadn't actually picked a desk or you didn't have one, but you still factored in where that desk was gonna go in your room, you may be able to now walk into that room and get a tape measure out and work out what is the biggest size desk you could get? Or what is the most practical size? Biggest may not be the right choice. It may be what is practical as well. And obviously, how much do you want to spend on this desk, okay? You may want to, as I said, buy a custom-built desk that's all fancy, specifically designed for rec recording and mixing stuff. You may not want that. You may not have the budget for it, or it may not even the budget. It just may not be suitable for your room. You may not find a pr an appropriate one of those, okay? So you might just go down to your local Ikea or, or wherever, you, whatever hardware store or furniture store you have in your local area, and just buy a simple desk. Don't feel you need to spend a lot of money. Now, I didn't spend a lot of money on my desk. My desk is very simple. It's not a custom built desk. It is a desk that I bought from a store here in Australia called Office Works. They sell office supplies. It was not a very expensive desk. It's very plain looking, just has a couple of legs and a blank white top on, on it. The next most important item of furniture to go into your studio is a chair. All right, so unless you're somebody that's going to buy a standing desk and stand up the entire time, I'm assuming you're gonna to wanna to sit down. So a nice chair that you can sit down. I generally like a, sort of an office style chair with wheels on it, a high back so I can sit back and listen to the music in comfort if I just wanna relax, chill out and absorb the music and, and you know just appreciate what I've created. And again, with every other piece of furniture and everything I'm talking about here, this may be something you already have, or it may be something that is in the house already that you wanna utilize. It may not be something you're gonna go out and buy, but if you are, obviously factor these in and think about it. Again, has to be comfortable too. Don't go and buy a chair that's uncomfortable. So other items to factor in as well are things like couches. If you're going to set up a room where you, it's big enough to fit a couch in and you like to lounge on a couch to write lyrics or think, or you're going to have other artists come into the room, you need to provide somewhere for them to sit while you're doing the recording. Now again, if this is an empty room and you're starting from scratch, you're gonna want things like cupboards, bookshelves, things to put books on, things to store microphones, cables, and another thing to think about, which a lot of people don't think about, is lighting, okay? So, you know, normally your room's gonna have a natural light, but that's not what you always wanna have on. You know, there's a good chance that unless you don't work or you, you're a student, you've got a lot of spare time in the day, you're probably gonna be spending a lot of your time in here at night time in your studio recording and, and planning and doing whatever you're doing. A lot of artists respond to the mood of a room and to, to create their music. You know, you need to get that vibe, you need to get that atmosphere in there to put you in the right frame of mind. You know, music is an art and an art is a feeling. You've gotta be creative, you know, it's not an analytical thing. So you need to be in the right frame of mind and the right mood. 
you know, if you're into uh, different genres of music, so if you're into metal or whatever, you may want to put some really freaky stuff in there, you know, some skull heads and whatever else, lights and, you know, things that really set the scene for your room, for your style of music and what you want to get out of this room. Obviously, you don't need to do it all day one, right? This stuff can develop over time, but consider it as you're going, as I said, for the future so that you know I want to put this stuff in so I'm going to plan for it and I'm going to accommodate space for it in my room or on my desk or wherever you need to put this stuff to get it in there and set that mood and make your home music studio look fantastic and actually make it fun and inviting to come into and work in there and enjoy the process of creating music. So we're going to talk about computers in this video and it's a crucial part of the home music studio these days. You know in the past usually you know you would have had separate little dedicated recording devices you know which might have recorded to tape or anything like that but today everything's done on computers. Now there's obviously still old school ways to do things but we're going to talk about computers because it's the most efficient way to do recording these days and most people are doing it that way. Now generally with your computers you're going to have two choices from a major perspective and that is PC like a Windows based system or a Mac, Apple Mac based system. So that's probably your first decision point. Now obviously if you've already got a computer and it's suitable for what you want to do in your recording and mixing then, then there really is no choice, that's what you're going to be using. But if you are looking at buying a new PC or a new Mac and you want to work out what you should get because you're going to make an investment to it or you want to get a dedicated PC or Mac purely for your home music studio and not utilise your existing PC that you do your internet surfing and social media and everything else on then that's great and let, we'll talk about all of that. Now which PC you choose, whether it's a Windows, Microsoft Windows based PC or a uh, Apple Mac PC is entirely up to you, okay? In the past there was a tendency that everybody wanted to use Apple Macs, most of the software worked on the Apple Macs, they were a lot more reliable and they were definitely more sought after for audio recording um, PCs. But today, the Windows-based systems have become a lot more reliable, a lot more powerful, and the applications themselves are running on them a lot more efficiently. And you don't have that problem anymore. So really, either choice is acceptable and either choice is fine. And which one you choose out of those two is really entirely up to you. It's going to be based on a few factors. One is price, budget. Can you afford it? You want to get the most bang for your buck out of this. Secondly, which one are you most comfortable with? If you're using a Windows uh, PC for your entire life, switching over to an Apple Mac now just for your recording side is going to be painful because you have to learn the new operating system. You need to learn all of the, the features about it, the restrictions, everything else. And same, vice versa. If you're an Apple Mac user, going out and buying a PC now is something that you're probably going to have to, again, learn. You're going to have to learn the restrictions on that, how to use what you can, what software you can get, and everything else. Now, from a physical hardware point of view, whether you choose PC or Mac, there are many options, again, in that realm. You can go for a laptop style. You can go for a mini form sort of PC you know, small compact unit. You could go for a big, large, thumping sort of big server chassis based system that you can expand, enhance and upgrade as you go along. You can do that with either system. Again, cost is going to come into it. The choice of a laptop is going to come in if you need portability. If you want to be able to take your system out to clients in their facilities and record, then you may want to get a laptop. Now, whichever choice you make, you want to make sure that it meets the specifications of the software that you're going to use to do your recording. Okay, there's no point 
getting a budget PC that just is not going to cut it for your software and it's going to crash all the time and it's just not going to perform. You're just not going to be happy with it. You're going to be fighting it all the time. So when you're picking your computer, what you want to look for is the CPU speed. Okay, these software programs to record on that are very CPU intensive. They've got to record audio live as you're playing them. They've got to perform well. If they can't keep up, they're going to crash and you're going to have all sorts of problems. Your recordings are not going to come out. They're just not going to work. Your music's going to stutter as you try to play it. Now with a CPU, you want to get, you want to find the sweet spot, okay? There's usually the budget price, which you want to stay away from. There's the top of the line, you know, brand new CPU that's just been released. That's the most powerful one out there at all. That's going to be like, four or five times the price of anything else. So I wouldn't go there either. What I'd find is there's usually a nice sweet spot where you get a very powerful CPU that's gonna last you, you know, quite a few years, but it's also not at the top of the line price, not at the extreme end of it. Now, the other major component that you wanna worry about when you're picking your computer is the amount of RAM you get. As a state of this software can take quite a lot of memory to run them. And especially if you're using things like virtual instruments, amp simulations, things like that, they are going to take up a lot of memory. So you're gonna to wanna to get as much memory as you can fit into your budget. Now, I would say don't go any lower than eight gig of RAM. Ideally, I would be suggesting 16 gig is probably a nice spot that's gonna last you a long time. So the next component in the system is going to be the hard disks that are in there. So generally in the past, you would have, uh, you know, a standard hard drive, you know, the old clunky style hard drives in your computers, and you'd want one for your operating system to run, boot the computer off, and then you would get a second one to record onto. And that second one should always be a 7200 RPM not a 5400 RPM. You want that speed because you're recording audio onto it live. And they're usually quite big. You can get terabytes of data onto them. Now we've moved into a position now where solid state drives or SSDs, which are sort of more like memory based drives are becoming a lot more affordable and a lot more common. Most laptops and PCs these days are coming with SSDs as their main boot drive that run their operating system. Now I've done that in my computer and I would suggest that's the smartest way to go. The computers beat up, boot up a lot faster and they just run way smoother with these SSDs. Now with the SSD as your main operating system boot drive, you still wanna have a second drive, at least one more drive, to do the recording of the audio on. It's still more efficient to record the audio on a second drive to what your computer is actually running off. Now, the other obvious things you need with your computer, especially if you're getting a tower-based server computer or a little small form factor computer, is you're going to need a monitor or screen to obviously see the software on and the computer. And I like to get a nice big one because when you're recording and mixing and stuff, you're doing a lot of editing of audio. You can get quite detailed and the programs are quite complicated and you can fit a hell of a lot on the screen. So I find a nice big screen a good option to go with, but obviously you need to consider what size desk you are gonna get and go back to the previous steps and think about that and how that's all gonna fit on your desk. Are you gonna have room for the monitor and your speakers as well? and how that's all gonna lay out. So it's gonna factor into the size of the screen, but I always like to get a nice big screen, one that obviously fits into my budget again. Now on top of that, you also need to then have a keyboard and a mouse, which obviously will go with all the options there. And there's nothing special about those. Just pick something that looks good, it's comfortable, fits on the desk and you're happy with, because there's nothing really extreme with those. So audio interfaces, what are they and why do you need one? So basically an audio interface is a external device that basically takes your uh, instruments or whatever you plug into it and allows it to be fed into your computer. 
It also takes the sound from your computer out to the audio interface and plays it on your speakers. So it is an essential item to your home music studio because you need to get audio into your computer and you want to get it out so that you can hear it. Now, but you might be wondering why do I need to get an audio interface? I have a computer or I have a Mac and it has sound connectors in it. It has a headphone plug, it has a line in or a mic in. The reason is, is because these interfaces on your existing computers are very cheap consumer based items that are just built in for your general plugging a crappy pair of speakers in, maybe recording, doing a Skype call or something like that. It's not a high detailed, good quality thing that you should be using for recording your audio or for playing back your audio when you are doing mixing and things like that. It's fine for your average day to day, but when you're talking about home music studio, you need to get to that next level. And, and then this is still part of the bare essentials, the audio interface, all right? You might say, oh, well, surely the bare essentials would be to use the onboard sound card. I don't consider that to be the case at all. I think for the price that an audio interface is, that is a bare essential and you should get one no matter what and don't use the internal on the computer audio. So how do you determine which one is the right one for you? So basically what you need to do is you need to think about again going back to all the other steps what are you going to be using your home music studio for what are you going to be recording what are you going to be playing out on so key components to the size of your audio interface are how many instruments do you need to plug into it and that you are going to record simultaneously now when i say simultaneously i mean actually recording at the same time. The fact that you play three different instruments does not mean that you need three inputs because you may only be able to record one of those instruments at a time. Now, if you're somebody that is a uh, vocalist who also plays acoustic guitar and you need to do both at the same time and you're gonna have two microphones, one for your voice, and one for the guitar, then you want two inputs so you can plug them in together and you can record them both at the same time. Now, the other reason you'll want multiple interfaces, inputs, is if you are recording something like drums where you need a certain amount of microphones. So, you know, if you need eight microphones on your drum kit to capture all of the drums at the same time, then you're gonna need an audio interface that has eight inputs. Now, as for outputs, you may want multiple outputs for a couple of reasons. One, you may want more than one set of speakers. So in my case, I have my good monitors that I use all the time. And then I have a couple of other options. I have a sort of smaller based, crappier style speaker to, to get a representation of what my song might sound like on other people's systems where they don't have studio grade speakers. I also have connections to a standard sort of home hi-fi system that you would have in your, your lounge room or your family room or whatever. If it isn't obvious already, when we're talking about the bare essentials, I'm talking about using headphones, and we will be talking about that going forward, and not using studio monitors. So in that case, your audio interface needs to have a headphone out plug. Now, pretty much all of them do. I don't think of any that don't but what they do is some will have one headphone out and some will have two or maybe even more now if you're the only person working in your studio then one headphone output is perfectly fine because you're the only one going to be wearing headphones but if you think you're going to be planning on working with other artists and you need a second set of headphones then you'll need an audio interface with two headphones out one for you and one for the other person. So the other main items to think about when you're picking your audio interface is obviously again, like everything else with these home music studios, because we're not all rich, you need to think about your budget and your, the price, okay? Have a budget in mind, think about what you can afford. Now, unless you buy a really, really dirt cheap audio interface, 
Most of the audio interfaces that are coming out today are all going to be pretty good quality. All right, it's almost impossible to go wrong with them because they all are made great and they all have really good quality. Obviously your top of your line items are going to have better quality, but you may not notice the difference at this stage and it's not necessarily going to be worth your money. So you're probably not going to go wrong with any of the audio interfaces out there unless you get something that really is bargain basement prices. So recording or mixing software, also commonly known as DAW or Digital Audio Workstation, sort of a term that everybody uses, but that generally term encompasses the PC as well. But I may slip into using that term, but I'll try and use recording and mixing software as I go. So this software is obviously a key component for you to record the audio. So you've got your You've got your furniture, your desk, you've got your PC, you've got your audio interface. Now you need some software to actually control all that and actually record your audio in as a song, as a project, whatever you want to call it, edit it, mix it, master it, whatever that software can do. So what is the purpose of the recording mixing software? Basically, you're trying to feed audio in and you're trying to play an instrument, record it, you need something to record it into. Now, with the proper recording mixing software, usually you can lay down multiple tracks, you can record individual items, so you can record a track of guitars, then bass guitar, drums, vocals, keyboards, everything, all individual on different tracks, and then mix them all together to and put effects on and all that sort of stuff to then bounce them out or export them to a normal stereo audio file that you can then put online, give to your family and friends. So that's the basic concept of what the software is meant to be used for. Now there's quite a few brands and versions of software out there. Pretty much all of them are very good and all of them are going to do right for you. There's not many that I wouldn't recommend and it's really down to what suits you and your workflow what type of instruments you're going to record and what gels with you. It's more about workflow than anything. Now, while all of the software pretty much will cater for anything that you need to do, some are better at certain things than others. Now, I'm pretty sure that every piece of software out there can do everything if you need it to. But as I said, some are better than others. You'll usually find a lot of producers, beat makers, that sort of thing. They like to a lot of the time, not all the time, lean towards things like Reason, Ableton Live, Fruity Loops, those sort of programs. Now these are programs that I haven't really used so I don't know a great deal about them, but I have heard a tendency of them being liked by people like that that like to arrange uh, music and things like that as opposed to recording live bands. Now it's not to say they can't record live bands, I'm assuming they can, but they're just better at doing other things. Whereas things like Pro Tools and Cubase, while they can also do all of that stuff, they're better at recording normal instruments and you know people playing in bands, etc. So which software you get, there is again, as I said, there's no right or wrong answer here. This is really about what suits you and your workflow. Every piece of software is good, but it doesn't mean every piece of software you are going to like. Some of them are going to function differently than others and you're going to gel better with one over another. Some people love Avid Pro Tools, other people hate it. Some people, like myself, love Cubase. Again, some people hate that. And same with all the other options. You know, one piece of software may not work for me, but it may work for you. Now, with ev like everything else, this is Bare Essentials Home Music Studio, budget comes into play. You may not want to buy Cubase because it might be too expensive for you or Avid Pro Tools and you want to get something more on the cheaper side of things and that's fine as long as it's the software you like but you need to consider that because we all have limited budgets. We all, we're not rich, well you may be but I know I'm not and I'm assuming you're not. So we need to keep those in mind, okay? Just because everybody's telling you to go and get Avid Pro Tools doesn't mean that it's right for you or you can afford it. 
Now, another thing I also like to recommend people is, are you going to be working with other people? Do you have friends that are already doing mixing, recording? If they do, what are they using? Because it can be quite beneficial for you to get the same software as them because you can work together, you can pass projects between each other, you can collaborate, you can help each other out with how to actually learn the software. You can you know, keep grilling your friends or your colleagues about how to do things in your software. So microphones. At this stage, part of the bare essentials, I'm going to assume that everybody's going to need a microphone. Now, there is a chance that you won't need one. Some people may be looking at using mainly uh, MIDI-based keyboards, virtual instruments, or electric guitars that plug directly into the PC using amp simulators. If you're one of those people, then when you get to the end of the video, you obviously can just put down that you're not going to get a microphone, you don't need one, and you can then move on. But for everybody else, I'm assuming that you are looking at getting a microphone for your recording purposes. So lots of instrumentation and vocals, etc., require some form of way of getting the audio into the computer. Now we've talked about the PCs themselves, the software, the audio interfaces, but to get into the audio interface, you need some sort of connectivity. And in this case, we're talking about a microphone. Now, a lot of people have probably used microphones, seen microphones, there's lots of varying types around, lots of different styles, shapes, brands, everything else. Generally, there's three types of microphones out on the market that you're going to be looking at for your home music studio. They are dynamic, condenser or capacitor, depending on which country you're in, and ribbon microphones. Now, Straight off the bat, I'm going to say that my ribbon microphones are generally considered to be a luxury item, and it's probably something we're gonna look at further down the track purchasing if you feel you need it. So which one you choose is going to depend mainly on what you're going to be recording. Now, I'm going to give you some general guidelines of what these microphones are used for, but keep in mind that these are not rules, they are not set in stone, and any of these microphones can be used to almost record any of these things. They're just going to give a different sound and a different vibe and you need to know how to use them. But we will go through the basic guidelines of what most people use the microphones for and why that is. All right, so let's start with the dynamic microphone. Okay, this is an example of a dynamic microphone. It is one of the most common out there. It is uh, reasonably priced and it is the Shure SM57. So you possibly may have heard of this. You may also not have heard of it, but it is very popular, especially in recording electric guitars. The major advantages of a dynamic microphone is, and again, this is one dynamic microphone. There's plenty of others, different shapes and different styles that have different purposes. Okay, this one here is renowned for working on amplifiers with electric guitars, but it's also commonly used on snare drums and other instruments like that and can be used on vocals if need be and anything. Okay, so the other type of microphone that I'm going to recommend is a condenser capacitor, and that looks something like this. Now again, they come in all shapes, sizes, and looks. So don't necessarily assume that something this shape is one. Uh, always look at the specs and make sure they are. These are very sensitive microphones, okay? They're very much used in studios for vocals. They can be used for guitar amps if need be, they would be used as room mics to capture ambience. They can be used on drums if done properly, and they're very good at acoustic style instruments like acoustic guitars or, you know, double basses, things like that. Anything that's sort of more acoustic and uh, not so much plugged in can be recorded with these because they are very sensitive, but they will also pick up a lot of the room. So they can pick up a lot of noise if you don't have a great room and things like that. 
So as I sort of said, this is sort of mic that's used a lot for vocals. So you'll see these in studios, you know, set up on a mic stand and the singer singing into it. Generally, you don't need to be right up in it like this. It's not going to be used in a live performance because it will pick up too much of the background sound because it is extremely sensitive and picks up everything everywhere. Now on top of the type of microphone, there's also different shapes or patterns of microphones. Now when I say patterns, I'm not talking about the look. Obviously there's tons of different looks of microphones and everything else, but there's a pattern which is the actual way that the microphone picks up the audio. So the four major types of patterns are a cardioid, omnidirectional, hypercardioid, and a figure of eight or bi-directional. So generally when we're talking with a dynamic microphone or even a condenser for vocals, you're probably looking at a cardioid. And if you look at the shape of it, usually with the center of the circle in the picture, that is where the microphone is. And then you'll see the little sort of bubble coming out and that is coming out the front. So the point of the microphone there is that it's picking up sound from the front of the microphone, but it's not picking up from the back. So most people are probably going to be dealing daily with a cardioid style where it's picking up from the front. You know, that's why we always place the microphone in a certain direction. You point the front at the person or the front at the instrument or the front at the amp, that sort of thing, because that's what you're picking up. Even though there's no rules about microphones and you know there's common practices and you can do whatever you like really to get the sound that you want, if, if you are looking for me to make a guided uh, sort of call for you, here's where I would probably start as Bare Essentials. If you are recording vocals, I would be looking at a condenser microphone as I showed you. And if I was looking at a recording acoustic guitar, I would probably go with that. If I'm looking at recording electric guitars with an amp and a speaker, I would be looking at the dynamic microphone. And if I'm looking at recording drums, my suggestion is to get a specific drum pack of microphones. Okay, they're reasonably priced. You get them in a bundle. You can get five packs or seven packs of microphones and they give you a combination of the right microphones for the right uh, part of the drum. So you'll have a specially designed mic for the kick, another one for the snare and some for the toms and maybe some room mics if you, uh, overhead mics if you get the seven mic kit. Now the price of the microphone. There is so much scope and variance in price. And again, it's going to come down to your budget and what you can afford. But here's some key things that generally get talked about. All right, these, if you go on certain sites and you look at professional studios, they're going to spend thousands of thousands of dollars on these microphones. But from a home music studio, you're going to sort of notice the difference in a few spots, okay? So anything that's sort of $100 below is going to be a really cheap mic and while it might be all you can afford, and if it is, then, then try it, but I think you'll be looking to upgrade quick. The difference between a $100 and a $500 mic will be a massive change, okay? There's a really big change in quality between 100 and 500. But from 500 up to something like 10 grand, the difference is gonna start to become even smaller. Now, to trained professionals that do this day in day out and recording very expensive albums and things that are making millions of dollars they will notice the difference and they will invest in those mics but for your home music studio you're going to have so many other problems in your room and so many other difficulties the detail that you're going to gain from spending that much money is going to be very very small So headphones, it is a key essential item to your home music studio. Now, if we were talking about mixing specifically, the recommendation generally is that headphones are not great for mixing. Now, while I sort of agree with that, 
I also partially disagree because it can be done. All right, it's not necessarily the best. I wouldn't focus on it, but it can be done. So it's not totally impossible. And for bare essentials to get started, I would definitely go with headphones because it is the easiest thing to set up in your room. Now, obviously with recording, we are going to need headphones, okay? Because generally if we're recording our vocals, we can't have the music playing out of speakers in the room because the mic you're recording your vocals in is going to pick that up as well. And we don't want that. We want to reduce as much noise as possible, including the music, out of that vocal mic so that when we record our vocals, they are purely just our vocals. And that goes for every instrument. It goes for our electric guitars, our acoustic guitars, everything else. Now, the big advantage to using headphones in a Bare Essentials home music studio is that it removes the need to have uh, acoustic room treatment in your room. It removes the need to have a, a, a nice laid out room or a desk in a very good place. You know, if you have your desk in the corner in a bedroom, no acoustic treatment at all, having headphones on eliminates that problem because you don't have audio bouncing off the walls into your ears. You're wearing headphones, right? So it's all isolated on you. Now, while there's tons and tons of headphones out on the market, what we want from a... So if, if we're talking about mixing and we're talking about listening accurately in high detail and getting our songs to accurately play to people out in the real world, so this is more on the mixing side, we want studio-grade headphones, okay? We want them to be a very flat response. They're not like consumer-based headphones that you're going to see in the store, you know, if you go down to the Apple store, and you're playing with the Beats headphones and stuff like that. They're not like that, okay? Those headphones generally will boost the bass so that it's really thumping, and they may even boost the highs so it's really bright, okay? That's not what we want, what we want out of our headphones. So knowing that you've determined that you need a set of studio-style headphones, then there is generally two options in regards to those. There's, there's sort of actually three. There's open back, semi-open, and closed. But I'm gonna to refer to just open back and closed back, because semi's sort of more in the realms of open anyway. They're just half and half. So here is an example of headphones I use. These are the Sennheiser HD 650s, really great for mixing headphones. Very flat response. And these are open back headphones. And when I mean open back, See here, you can see that it's very open. You can see through it. It's not a sealed unit, it's very open. So that means the sound comes out. But what it does is it lets the headphones breathe. So you get more of a natural sound to the audio, a bit more bass, and it just represents a lot better. So these are the sort of headphones I will use while I'm mixing if I'm using that. The downside to these headphones is, as I said, sound comes out, which means if I was using these while recording vocals, a lot of music would be coming out into the microphone because it is just bleeding out constantly. It's just coming out. So the other style is a closed back headphone. And this is sort of an extreme version of a closed back, but you can see that is a solid piece of plastic, okay? and it keeps the sound in, the sound can't come out. The, the sound quality of these are a little bit stranger, they're not as good, but what they're really good for is for recording vocals and instruments because very little sound is leaking out of these headphones, so they're not going to get into your microphone. You're not gonna end up with the Boomin metronome or click track going across your microphone recordings. They're keeping them in. So again, which one you get depends on what you're primarily going to do. Now, I would recommend, to be honest, if you're looking at recording and mixing as you go, I would get both sets as I have here. And the reason I would say get both sets is because you don't necessarily need a great set of closed back headphones for recording vocals because you're not looking for detail. What you're looking for is to be able to hear the music while you sing. And as long as it's allowing you to sing good or play your instrument good, to the music, then it's fine. So what you want to do, or what I recommend, is getting a sort of mid-range, cheap price of closed-back headphones for recording. 
and then I would get a good set of uh, open backs for my mixing and mastering style sessions. So even though I say cheap closed back headphones, don't go too cheap. I mean, really what you want is not necessarily audio quality, but what you probably want is comfort. You know, you want to be comfortable where you're recording with those headphones on. If they're very uncomfortable or painful, you're not gonna enjoy the experience. So I'd be looking more at comfort in the closed backs as opposed to quality and keeping the price reasonably down. So basic acoustic treatment, okay? When I'm talking about in this situation, again, this is for the bare essentials part of a home music studio. Normally we talk about acoustic treatment, we're talking about putting stuff on the walls and the ceilings and stuff like that to control audio frequencies. But what I'm talking about here is just some acoustic treatment around your instrumentation because we're recording in a, in a room that's not an ideal situation. It's not designed for recording. It's got some issues, it's gonna have some noise, it's gonna have some bad reflections and you know, reverb that probably doesn't sound great. Things are gonna bounce off walls and stuff like that. So we wanna do a little bit of treatment to control that. So it involves just a couple of very small, quick things generally, and they're not very dear, quite cheap. And again, this is gonna depend on what you're actually recording. What I'm talking about mainly is your microphones. Now, if you are talking about a dynamic microphone with an SM57 on a guitar amp cabinet, you probably don't need to do any sort of acoustic treatment with that because it doesn't really pick up sound from the back and because you usually put it so close to the amp, it's all it's gonna hear. But if you're recording acoustic guitar or vocals and you've got a condenser microphone that's sitting a little bit away from you, okay, we need to do a couple of things to it. So the first thing I would do with a condenser microphone, specifically for vocals, as opposed to acoustic guitar, is to put a, uh, a pop shield or windscreen or whatever you want to call it in front of that microphone. And the reason for it is, is that it basically filters out some of your breath, but not the sound so much. So the reason we want to do that is when we do P's, T's, a lot of air comes out and that hits the microphone at such a power and such uh, quickness that it can cause things like what P's, what I call P-pops, where you'll get this boom sound and it's very low, very annoying, and it comes across your microphone recordings, as I said, very annoying. Now, they can be removed with some very uh, advanced, expensive software, but if we can avoid it in the first place, it's so much better. Plus, it's also a really good thing that if you put it slightly away from the microphone, because a lot of people like to sing right on the microphone, if you sing on that windscreen or pop filter, it keeps you away from the microphone enough to make it sound more natural. So it's a good placement tool as well. Now, the other thing I like to do, and this is for vocals and for acoustic guitars, is to have something that goes behind the microphone. So you can get some pre-built uh, semi-circle style uh, acoustic treatment panels that sit behind. Again, they can mount on the, the mic stand or however, they could be freestanding as well, and they sit behind it. And the advantage of that is that as you sing into the microphone or play guitar, if you don't have that there, what happens is your sound will obviously go through the mic, past the mic as well, and can potentially bounce off a wall and come back to the microphone as a reflection or a bit of reverb that doesn't sound nice because your room's not great and muddies up and messes up the recording a little bit, making it not as clear and crisp as you may want it. Now you can obviously build your own as well, or you could just put some really thick blankets or something behind it. However you need to do it, that's fine, but obviously some pre-built ones look nicer. They're properly designed and they mount to the stands, whereas you other ones are not. So you could create some ad hoc sort of things. Now, another thing you can get is something that I call and other people I've heard referred to as gobos. And they're sort of like acoustic paneling 
that's built into a frame, potentially with wheels on it, that's movable so that you could sort of have a couple of them and shape them around you as you sit down with your acoustic guitar. So it's a bit more than just a sort of vocal acoustic treatment. It's a bigger sort of spance. And again, it stops all that reflection and sound going past the microphone and going out. So hopefully by this stage you have watched all the other sections and you are moving along quite nicely with your Bare Essentials Home Music Studio. So now if you haven't already done so, what I recommend is that you take all of your parts that you've already listed out, all the components that you look to buy, uh, if you haven't already got them, take the entire thing, condense it all down to a list and start to work on the pricing. Now you may have already done this, you may already have some pricing, so jot it all down, make sure it's all together and start to come up with your final budget price for your Bare Essentials Home Music Studio. Now hopefully this is going to fit into your budget and if it's not, then you need to start looking at what you could potentially cut back, remove. Did you go a little bit too uh, expensive with something? Can you reduce it down somewhere along the lines? Or is it something that you need to save up for and get a bit more money before you can progress this? Is there some parts that you can do a bit at a time to get to where you need to go with your budget? So when you're working in your pricing, obviously I recommend that you check out some of your local stores if you've got any look on eBay, look on Amazon, Sweetwater, whatever famous shops or major outlets that you know online, check them out, look worldwide, compare prices. You wanna see if you can get the best price. The other thing is, is there any secondhand gear that fits what you're looking for? Obviously you can save big money if you can get some secondhand stuff. Now, if it all fits in your budget and you're ready to go, you're keen to get started, then feel free to start buying the, the kit now and start setting it up, right? There's no reason to wait any longer, right? You've got to the point where now it's time to move with it and prepare for it. If you're not ready, you need to save up some money. Now, now is the time to know what your budget is, what you, what you need your budget to be, and to save up to that level so that you can start buying the kit. Now, if you find some products online, just be wary of a few things. Make sure that if they're overseas, that uh, you're catering for currency conversion. You know, if you live in a different country and the dollar's different, make sure you factor that in because otherwise that can blow your budget right out. Also, that applies to shipping. Sometimes shipping can be very expensive from another country. The other major things to think about is warranty. So, you know, it's always better if you can buy them locally, if it's a reasonable price. But obviously there's times I buy stuff online all the time. Um, generally, I'll still try to buy it in my own country, but I do buy from overseas sometimes. But you need to know that potentially warranties are gonna be hard to claim. So if it's a really cheap item, it may not matter because it just may be, it's not worth it, I'll throw it out. But you know, if there's an expectation that you need to ship the item back under warranty, that can be very expensive to ship it back to an overseas company. Now, the other thing to factor in is the power, okay? So you need to check that that unit can actually operate on your power in your country. And if it can, does it have the right adapters? Can you replace the cables? Is it a switchable item that can switch from one voltage to another to suit your system? Or is it simply a USB powered system, which is fine, that's universal, there's no difference there in any country. But if it actually has to plug into a wall, you know, a standard power source, then you need to make sure that's gonna work in your country because things in other countries obviously don't always work. Items like software can usually be purchased overseas without any dramas because, you know, warranties, it's, it's quite simple. Um, generally, most software companies don't offer you warranties anyway, but they'll offer you patches and things like that. And most of the software is just easily downloadable. It's a license key, doesn't matter what country you're in. So I generally find that for me, especially here in Australia, I can get software from the US, even with the exchange rate of our dollar being not so great, uh, still being cheaper than it is to buy it in Australia. 
So just one last thing before I finish up, I just want to thank you for taking the time to watch this content and thank you for trusting me in teaching you about the bare essentials of the Home Music Studio course and I'm hoping that you're getting great results out of it and I'm hoping that you enjoyed the course. I want to congratulate you for getting all the way through it and I'm hoping that I will be congratulating you because you are successfully getting your home music studio up and you will be getting to the next phase of recording. If at any stage you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below the video. I'm happy to help whenever I can, as much as I can. Now, if you're wondering where you can go from here, if you are happy with this course, you enjoyed it a lot and you want to see more, I have a, a bigger course that goes in greater detail in the Bare Essentials Plus beyond that to a more advanced home music studio and it's called setting up a home music studio so this is a full course full pdf lots and lots of videos included in that course so again thank you for watching this course and hopefully i will see you in another course soon